Welcome, everybody, to another wonderful Sunday episode here on the SITREP Podcast. I'm your host, Ariskini Jim, and today we are going to be building some actual hobby. So if you hear anyone coughing and gagging in the background, that's my poor girlfriend who is still kicking the Kung Flu, or whatever you want to call it. I had it last week. She's getting over it this week, so we do apologize if you hear any coughing in the background, but it will be kept to a minimum. Um, we're, we both have our vaccines, we have our uh, boosters, we're not badly affected by it, it's all good, we're just kind of getting over the last little bits of it here. Alright, so uh, welcome to the chat, Piotr, thanks very much for coming out, and of course thank you Jen, and hopefully we get some more people as we go, but for now, let's go ahead and kind of get started. So the kit we're building today is going to be the 15 millimeter. Bradley kit. Uh, it's an APC or IFV, depending on which version you use, depending on which definition you use. Uh, it's the big American infantry carrier, tracked vehicle type um, that we used, good lord, since the 19, like the mid 1980s. Uh, it was, uh, it originally replaced the M113, uh, which is why a lot of people consider the Bradley a terrible vehicle. It had a very controversial development. Um, it's an APC and armored personnel carrier, and it carries one half, in fact, a little bit less than one half of the infantry that its predecessor did. So it costs, you know, three times as much and does the job half as well. Um, service in Desert Storm especially, but also in Iraq uh, subsequently in 2003, has sort of mitigated this bad reputation a little bit. But the fact remains that this is one of those vehicles that, I mean, if you ever talk to anybody, especially in the United States about the Bradley, you're going to get, it's good, you're, you're, I'll put it to you this way, you're going to start a conversation. Um, <laughs> so whether or not it's a pleasant conversation or not is going to be a thing. But yeah, it's the army wanted one thing. The lobbyists and defense contractors and people on the Senate Armed Forces Committee and the lobbyists that controlled them basically gave them something else and then charged the American taxpayer uh, through the nose for it. This is the reason a lot of people don't like the Bradley, even though it's done very well in conflicts like Desert Storm and Iraqi Freedom and so on. So that's the reason you sort of get like this, you know, half and half dozen in one hand, six in the other kind of attitude about the Bradley. It is a controversial view. Um, to be sure. Uh, so, wow, Damon's with us. Thanks very much. Um, FYI, there's about a 30 second delay. Yeah, uh, no worries, Shin. That's normal latency for a stream. In fact, 30 seconds is pretty good uh, for latency between you know when I say something and when it pops up uh, in the actual chat. Um, so I'm coming up here. Uh, I like to talk about the Bradley almost as much as the Patriot movie. Not because. Uh, People will ask me, sometimes in streams, sometimes in Discord or whatever, you know, what do you think about the Bradley? Is the Bradley a good vehicle? Uh, people on other websites go off on rants about the Bradley. They've made a movie about this on Netflix. And of course, people say, hey, I just saw this movie on Netflix. What the hell's going on over here with this Bradley thing? I thought it was pretty good. And they look up things like um, uh, Ghost Troop in the Battle of 73 Easting, where the Bradley absolutely kicked ass. Uh, and they're like, you know, now they're saying it's a terrible vehicle. Well, it is and it isn't. It depends. It does very well at what it's designed to do. It's just, is it designed for the wrong thing? Um, I'm, I have my personal feelings about it. However, this is a question for the 1980s. It's now the 2020s. It's too late to argue about it now. Um, it's, it's what the army has and properly used now that the army has sort of been forced to reorganize itself around the Bradley. Is it a good vehicle? That's kind of, you know, whether or not they should have had to do that, that's up to you. Um, but the Bradley as it stands now, although like a lot of American equipment, it's getting a little long in the tooth. It's been around almost 40 years. Um, it's you know, about high time for a replacement. It has been upgraded, so it's doing pretty well. Um, so correspondence around the world, uh, the Bradley tank. Yeah, it's, it's an APC that's often, like we saw on Desert Storm, often required to fight like a tank. And it's not designed to do that. If you take a Bradley up against T-72s and those T-72 crews know what they're doing, the guys they ran into Al Talakana Division at, um, at uh, 73 Easting um, in February of 1991 didn't really know what they were doing. So thank God for that. But um, yeah, suffice it to say, 
125 millimeter smooth bore gun out of a T72 is gonna go through a Bradley like it's and not even slow down. Um, it's it's pretty fortunate. Uh, it speaks to the good training of um, Second Armored Cavalry Regiment and the poor training of the Iraqi Republican Guard that uh, Bradley heavy components of Second Armored Cavalry Unit, Second Armored Cavalry Regiment, like Eagle Troop, got a not Eagle Troop. Eagle Troop was mostly Bradley's Ghost Troop. Um, was mostly Bradley's. Why they got away, not to say get away with it, but why they did as well as they did. Um, yeah, it's often expected to perform like a tank, and it's it's not a tank. Um, it was expected to perform as an APC, and it carries six troops. The M113 could carry 13 troops. So it, you know, <laughs> it doesn't do it nearly as fast, and it doesn't carry all these other weapon systems, the 25 millimeter Bushmaster cannon that we see there, the um, double tube tow missile launcher, all this stuff. Well, it doesn't really need that. It's supposed to carry troops. You need, you need a big box with armor. The only reason we got rid of the M113 is it wasn't fast enough. Um, the M113 was built to keep up with the M60. And, uh, you know, when the, which did fine. But then when the M1 came out, back then the M1 could do 45 miles an hour, you know, relatively comfortably. The M113 just couldn't keep up with that. So we needed a faster version of the M113. And what we wound up with was the Bradley. Again, that's up to your own judgment, whether that was a good thing or a bad thing, but it, it, my personal opinion about it is that it's water under the bridge at this point. It's 35 years ago. Um, so, so this is a good piece of information. I like to talk about the Bradley almost as much as the Patriot movie. Yeah, I mean, personally, I, I won't even get up on that soapbox. So that's not why you guys came out. So Dennis Cross says, the Bradley, overpriced, and too many folks try to make it into something that it was never meant to be. Yeah, um... So uh, Dennis uh, Novus Templar is on the soapbox that I was trying not to get on uh, in the stream. Long story short, take your first shot. I completely agree with Dennis Cross. He's absolutely correct. Uh, I just was hoping not to get into it because it gets into politics and how American defense appropriation works and the role of K Street in Washington, D.C. It, it, it's no longer a military question. It turns into this whole revolving door between the DOD and um, the, 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 uh, the Pentagon and... Um, you know, defense contractors, it, it turns into a big murky mess that, frankly, has nothing to do with hobby. But anyway, okay, so let's finally turn off this stupid uh, title screen here and get to our camera. Hey, a hobby board, that's why we came here. All right, so um, after about a year and a half of hiatus of not really building any miniatures, um, as you guys have seen in recent weeks, I'm trying to finally get back into miniatures. Uh, my first little project recently was the T-80 platoon from uh, Team Yankee, or I should say from Battlefront 4 Team Yankee. Um, these bad boys are finally done, as you may have seen on Discord. And um, yeah, we are finally all set on these bad boys. Let me see if I can get this guy in a decent... Oops, hold on. Sorry, guys. So there we go with the... Uh, commander of my T-80. Now, of course, this is the T-80 as seen in uh, Team Yankee, so it's a 1980s T-80. It doesn't have either the K-1 or much less the K-5 um, reactive armor panels that you're going to see like in conflicts like the Ukraine nowadays. Um, so, like the T-80s that you'll see on the news, fighting for either side, really, um, Russians have started to bring in T-80s. They swore off the T-80 after the Second Chechen War, they did absolutely terrible for the Russians in the Second Chechen War. Um, and they kind of swore them off. They weren't going to use them anymore. Well, now they're using T-80s. They're using T-62s for crying out loud. They're, they're really starting to get in bad shape over there. Um, ironically, most T-80s that you see nowadays are fighting for the Ukrainian armed forces because the Kharkov factory that built most of the T-80s back in the Soviet days, of course, you know, Kharkov is in Ukraine, when the Soviet Union fell apart um, and, the, and the new national boundaries were set up, well, that tank was on the wrong side of the border. Um, there is a factory uh, up near St. Petersburg that can make some components of the hull, but in order to build a complete T-80, you need the Kharkov factory, and only uh, Ukraine has that to my knowledge. So when you see the Russians using up their older T-80s, they're using up their older stock, which they put in storage after Second Chechen War, and to my knowledge, they said they were never going to use again. 
because uh, specifically 4th Guards Tank Division went into um, the Second Chechen War in 2004-2005 and they got, it, it did not go well for them at all. Um, so you have the Ukrainian T-80, the T-80B, uh, the T-80U, then you get into the T-84s, which is basically a Ukrainian upgrade, uh, T-84 Oplot, and the, you know there's this whole tech tree that comes out of the T-80 um, after that, which would not look exactly like this. Particularly these little uh, spots here along the, tur the turret face. This is where you're going to see the much more modern reactive armor. Um, you're going to see more modern reactive armor here on the glacis plate. And you're going to see additional uh, gadgets up here on the turret roof where the new more advanced battle sites are. Uh, thermal imaging, ballistic fire control computers, uh, commander sites, um, gunners, uh, engagement ports, and stuff like that. Um, Against my usual judgment, uh, I did put the stupid barrels on the back of the tank. Again, I, I wish they wouldn't do that. Um, although, like we see in Ukraine, a lot of times the Russians are still going into combat with these dumbass uh, extra few tanks uh, on the back. This is another soapbox I get on a lot. The Russians don't, or uh, the Russians aren't supposed to have these on the back of the tank when they're in combat. And on your table, you're going to see that the point of the table is you want to see the tanks as they appear in combat because you're having a war game. So when the tank is driving from the railhead or from you know wherever you know they got brought into the operational battle area, and then they're driving from that embarkation point towards the uh, you know the actual front line, they draw the fuel out of these auxiliary tanks, and when they actually get into combat or close to combat, they're supposed to eject these, and the engine starts drawing off the internal fuel tank, which is vulnerable enough, but at least it's not hanging off the back of the tank in a literal you know two like like 55 gallon you know oil drums i don't know what the hell that's supposed to be anyway um went ahead and uh built all my t80s so stage one complete um there was also a build video i hope you guys saw and enjoyed or you uh, found useful where i built all of my m1s so got a little bit of something on there there uh, I went ahead and I built all my m1s you saw me build one on camera uh in my build video i went ahead and i built the other four so now I've got the full um, platoon plus. An American platoon is usually four tanks. So now I've got the full, you know, five tanks built. Uh, and of course, I've got them primed. Um, I have not got them painted yet. Because unlike Piotr, who is hopefully still in the chat. Hello, Walkabout Games. Thanks very much for coming by, Chris. Um, I am nowhere near brave enough to try that four color or three color um, M-E-R-D-P. I can't remember the actual name of it. Um, that, that 1980s camouflage scheme that you see for Team Yankee. Um, also, in all seriousness, I mean, number one, yeah, that kind of... I, I sort of did it a little on my T-80, sort of a three-color camouflage scheme. So I'm sure I could do it if I really, really wanted to on my M1s. But it would be kind of a pain in the ass. Also, I don't really want to use these in a Team Yankee 1980s Soviets invade Germany setting. Because it never happened. Um, you guys know me, I'm mostly a historical guy. I would want to use these in some kind of either um, Desert Storm or Iraqi Freedom uh, sort of a scenario. So long story short, it's going to get a paint job a little like this. These are originally M60s, M60A1s uh, specifically, from the Ryan Leathernecks box, also from uh, Battlefront, 50mm Team Yankee. And then I went ahead and built my own um, ERA panels to look like the Marine Corps M60A1 ERAs that we actually saw in February 1991, uh, and also January, January and February of 1991 uh, in the Gulf. So if you buy the Ryan Leather next box and you want to build a Desert Storm Force, do not look for these because they're not going to be in the box. I had to make those myself. Um, built them in Photoshop, printed them out, mounted them, and uh, yeah, there we go. But this is the kind of color scheme that's eventually going to be on these M1s. Now, the reason I kind of went through all that is because, you know, okay, Jim, you had a build video for your T80s. You built the T80, you primed the T80, you painted the T80, you had painting videos for all that. Why didn't you finish up your M1s before you went on to your Bradleys? We're going to start the Bradleys today. Because, again, I'm going to build sort of a uh, Eagle Troop, Ghost Troop kind of a force um, for 73 Easting. Dina Ridge, uh, stuff like that. That's going to be for Gulf War and also uh, 2003 Iraqi Freedom. Um, hence, I went with the M1A1 variant 
Uh, I didn't get super technical with the M1A2 stuff. Uh, I didn't modify these to the, the M1s that you see nowadays on the news, where they're you know they're super upgraded to you know different uh, different levels. We are sticking strictly with what was around in the 90s and the early 2000s. So now that my camera's off. Um, okay, so today we're going to build the Bradley Trooper. And the reason I wanted to build the Bradleys and then later on off camera I'm going to prime the Bradleys is because I want the Bradleys and the M1s to be painted at the same time. Because for anyone who's ever built anything in the desert, I'm sure you've noticed, desert sand and khaki is murderously, ridiculously, horrifyingly unforgiving. You would think that that would be uh, you know an easy paint scheme to do. It isn't. Um, khaki can change from a yellow to a green to a bluish to a pink tint uh, super, super easily if you are not really, really careful. In fact, you can kind of see it here in my... Notice my ERA panels are not really the same color as the base of the tank. It goes from a, a yellowish pink down to more of a yellowish green on the actual steel for the tank. So even on these tanks, which I'm still very happy with, but even on these tanks, you can see a little bit of a, of a flaw there. It's really, really tough to do. Also, this was airbrush paint. This was a laser jet printer, because again, I made these in Photoshop. So to get these colors to match, I got as close as I could. But long story short, I want to be able to airbrush all my AIM-1 Abrams and all my Bradleys at once. With the same pot of paint, wham, bam, I get all 10 vehicles done at once. Five Bradleys and five Abrams. That's the reason I'm kind of building these two model kits in kind of a weird, um, whatchamacallit, M-E-R-D-C. Thank you, Piotr. Uh, that's the reason I'm trying to build these two uh, kits in more of a um, more of an assembly line kind of a fashion. But anyway, enough talk. Let's do our live unboxing. You see here it's still in the plastic. I have no idea what's in here. I'm sure it's great because, you know, obviously Battlefront stuff is always awesome. Uh, right off the bat, we can see that they're giving you options and pieces for two different variants. So, yeah, no worries there. It's a live unboxing, folks. For all I know, there's a Chucky doll in here. Let's see what's up. All right, we got some sprues. All right, make sure there's up. Oh, make sure I don't leave anything in the box. And some packing. All right, cool. So, um, no big deal. It's, you know, kind of what you would expect. Uh, looks like two sets of five sprues that you normally see in a Battlefront kit. Um, they give you enough pieces to where um, there's enough parts on the sprue where you wind up with, uh, it, it winds up requiring two sprues, especially in the size box that they, that they send. They don't send you a giant you know, bookshelf size box. So we got two uh, sprues. Obviously, it's going to be two sprues per vehicle. Um, we also have some cards because you have to have the cards to play the game. So that's going to be awesome. Let's take a look at the cards real fast. Because Piotr was cool enough to share the link with uh, some Team Yankee groups on Facebook. So if you're from the Facebook Team Yankee group, um, welcome to the Sit Rep Podcast. We hope you uh, like us and subscribe to us and you know, like what you see here. But obviously the cards are you know, very high quality, nice and glossy. In fact, I'm trying not to get too much of the shine uh, on camera there. And uh, yeah, it's easy to play. Um, I'm not usually a fan of card-driven games, but this isn't cards like you have to draw them out of a deck. This is a nice little stat card, so you don't have to have the book open on your table, you know, ruining your terrain and, um, you know, making your, your your table, you know, not look at... You put all that work into the table, who wants to have a big open book, you know, lying there on the table, uh, screwing things up. Uh, we have some special rules for them. Yeah, the usual stuff that you uh, sort of expect, along with how to build Bradleys realistically into 1980s and 1990s orders of battle, like the other kind of stuff that you would have um, in your unit. So that's pretty cool. Um, usually with the Battlefront kit, you also get a sprue of commanders. Normally I have, you know, the box comes with five uh, kits in it or with five vehicles. 
I use one as the commander, so I wind up using just one out of this um, strip of commanders. Of course, they give you six. Sometimes they give you five, sometimes they give you six. Long story short, I have a huge pile, an ever-growing overpopulation mass of um, semi-dismembered American commanders just hanging out of turrets. So, cool. Again, one sprue from each uh, set, so to speak, so that we can build one vehicle here on camera. Put the rest of the side just for a minute. Get that mouse out of the way. Make sure our focus is still good. Let's get the focus back the way we want it. Cool. And now it's time to actually start building some stuff. So I'm gonna change the music here. And we're gonna start building uh, some kits. Okay, so as we saw in the back of the box, it gives you two different types of um, M2. And that music might be a little loud. Hold on a second, guys. Give me a second. Turn that down just a skosh. There we go. Um, the kit gives you two different types of Bradleys that you can build. Okay. This is, long story short, uh, to make things simple, this is the 1980s, early 1990s Bradley. The kind that doesn't have this extra armor panel on the side. This is what you would use in Team Yankee if you're playing literal Team Yankee out of the novel, i.e. 1980s, or if you're playing Desert Storm. This is what you would use if you are playing uh, something a little bit more modern, like Iraqi Freedom or um, Enduring Freedom, Iraq, Afghanistan, something more in the 2000s. So 19, roughly speaking, again, there might be some people in the chat who might want to, you know, wiki snipe me, but in general terms, 1980s, 1990s for Team Yankee or Desert Storm, 2000s forward, something more modern, build this one. And this is the more modern one. This is the original one. You see here, this has additional armor, these little pegs, these little, you know, um, additional armor plating that sits on top of that. So now we're going to go ahead and start cutting stuff out of the sprue with my knife. I know a lot of you guys are um, clippers guys. I'm going to continue to use my knife. Although I may change the blade ends. 3rd long story short in 20 minutes. Okay, Peter. I see how you are. Everyone knows I talk too much. That's why they come out to these streams. Oh, I'm over cleaning now. I already damaged my first piece. That ain't good. See, I knew that some parts of the stream were going to be a little dull with me just like cutting and cleaning stuff off the off the uh, off the sprue. So I tried to get some slightly more engaging music, so my entire audience wasn't fast asleep. I don't know which is worse, Piotr. The fact that that was my third. Long story short, in 20 minutes, or I was talking for more than 20 minutes. They're actually both pretty bad. So I honestly don't know um, which one I'm going to do here for uh, which Bradley type. Because there's a real, I mean, for the kind of mi miniature gaming I like to do, there's a good use case for both. Um, I'm probably going to go with the, uh, ooh, that's a bad, that's a bad spot there. Look at that. Oof. That was a weird joint point there, but no worries. We got through it. Um, I'm probably going to go with the original. That way I can do, again, Desert Storm. Which I do have an Iraqi army already built. Um, so as soon as I have some American armor put together, I'm, I'm all set. So I'll probably just do it that way. I also have a big Soviet force, obviously, as you see. I've got uh, 
two types of T-72s. These are Svezda T-72s, ironically from a Russian um, uh, miniature company. That has the K-5 reactive armor panel on there. And then I have the original T-72s. Uh, these are the ones that came from uh, Battlefront. Actually, these are pre release Battlefront. These were still in resin. When they hadn't even finished, when I went to the Team Yankee boot camp in November 2015, they hadn't even come out with the plastics yet. These are like right out of the pre-factory release, whatever you want to call it. These, are, I don't think, were ever actually released to the public. Uh, these are resin prototypes uh, of the T-72s that we got at the uh, November 2015 on tabletop Team Yankee boot camp. Can't believe those miniatures are almost seven years old. Which explains why they're painted the way they are. They're painted back, back before I even got an airbrush. I was still using rattle cans. Piotr says he really wants to get us drunk today. <laughs> Piotr, if you need me to get you drunk, um, you're not doing it right. Uh, you have to be able to do that on your own. All right, so we're very going to quickly uh, punch out a little bit of... Uh, looks like the whole bottom here, obviously. Uh, what I was saying before about the Soviet force and whether or not I'd ever get to use them against an American desert force, um, there's still a use case for that. And I'm really surprised more people on the web are not talking about this. Maybe I'll do something on Sidra Podcast. Everyone rants and raves, obviously, um, about Team Yankee. And, you know, deservedly so, because you know, Team Yankee's awesome. Team Yankee, of course, is Harold Coyle's novel from um, the late 1980s, based on Sir John Hackett's little uh, cinematic universe, for lack of a better term. So when you're playing Team Yankee, um, you know, based on Harold Coyle's novel, what you're really playing is Sir John Hackett's Third World War in Europe, uh, August 1985, uh, which is a fantastic book. It's written, it's not really a novel. I mean, obviously it's a novel because that war never took place. But it's written like it was a history book. It's written as if it is 20 years or so after the real 1985 Third World War in Europe. And it's, uh, you know, this is like one of the first history, one of the first official histories uh, to come out on that conflict. And you get a much broader view I mean, Team Yankee, you obviously, the, as the book suggests, one American company, or technically team, a temporary company, uh, hence Team Yankee. I think they're with um, 1st Battalion, 75th Infantry Mechanist. Uh, and that's pretty much it. You get a little bit of battalion view, but really not much. In Third World War 1985, you get the entire global view um, of everything that's going on in that little cinematic universe. So especially if you're a Team Yankee player and you're interested in, um, you know, the British, the Germans, the Dutch, you know, all the other factions that you can play in Team Yankee, um, I would definitely recommend that book because that's when you get a little bit more insight into what's going on. And on the other, the other parts of Germany and also other fronts of that, you know, fictitious Third World War setting. All right, there is the turret with that 25 millimeter Bushmaster I was talking about. In fact, if you guys will hold on and forgive me for just about 10 seconds, I'll be right back with an interesting piece of kit you might, you might find interesting. Give me just a second, everybody. All right, who's ready for some one-to-one -one scale gaming? Here's some one-to-one -one scale hobby. This is the 25 millimeter Bushmaster at 15 millimeter or one to 100 scale, roughly. That's the round in real life. 
So this is a 25 millimeter uh, round fired out of a um, 25 millimeter Bushmaster automatic cannon uh, on a Bradley. Um, obviously it's been demilitarized. So it's not gonna blow up here on camera, unfortunately. That might actually get us some additional views. But uh, yeah, the primer's already been you know, uh, demilitarized. There's no, if you could hold this, you would feel that there's nothing in the back in the, in the cartridge part of the, of the round. But that's the actual round that comes out. It extends about that deep into the casing. And then that thing's coming at you at about three times the speed of sound, at like 125 rounds a minute. Um, so yeah, a pretty a pretty decent weapon, especially if it has like API, uh, different types of ammunition. I don't know exactly what kind of round. I think this is just basically an APC type ammunition, uh, armor piercing core. But there's obviously high explosive, there's API, there's all kinds of stuff you can put in this. So. That's how big they are in real life. Not quite as big as a um, Warthog round. Piotr says most of my French are still resin. That's pretty cool. So the Bradley has had uh, an interesting development, especially in the original 1980s, uh, the original, original one, like the prototypes. I opened up this sprue, I half expected to see a motorcycle on the back of this thing. Yes, the original M3 scout vehicles, the Calvary version of the M3, they had a little moped sort of bolted to the back of the thing, because that was going to be a thing, right? The thing beats, uh, you know, safety, like uh, in the middle of a World War III battlefield, your Bradley is going to stop in the middle of the, the battlefield. One of your crew is going to hop out and start, uh, you know, swanning around on a friggin' little Kawasaki rice rocket. That's going to fly. You're not going to get shot off that thing, you know, <laughs> in about 10 seconds flat. Yeah, the Bradley started off with some very interesting, uh... Ooh, this is weird. Right, I'm hoping I'm cutting this correctly. Yeah, the Bradley definitely started off with some very interesting... Okay, make sure the sprue is clean. The Bradley started off with some very interesting, uh, design ideas, to put it mildly. Those god awful um, firing ports. That here, here's American Defense Department thinking in the 1980s. Let's put firing ports in the side of the of the hull, so the the, the crew on the inside of the vehicle, or not the crew, the passengers, the infantry that he's carrying, on the inside of your APC can fire their weapons while they're still inside the vehicle. Okay, that sounds good in theory. That never ever ever works because you're talking about firing your rifle through a keyhole you can't see anything um you can't aim anything you can't swing your shoulders left to right to aim the vehicle, to aim the weapon because you're packed in there with five other guys um it doesn't work so bad enough that you put those in there because it you know, weakens the armor and adds all these vulnerabilities to destruction but then on top of that they make it where you can't even use... Ooh, I just kind of damaged my... Oh, no. Hold on, guys. I'm talking to you guys while I'm cutting these pieces out. Uh-oh. All right, I will have to repair that track a little bit. I, I got a little too aggressive with uh, cutting that off in there. But I, I'll be able to fix that. No worries. Um, yeah, they designed it where you couldn't even fire your own rifle out of the port. The port was designed in such a way where the only kind of port that would fit, the only kind of rifle that would fit through it was a special carbine version of the M16 service rifle that would screw, I'm actually not kidding about this, that would sort of screw into these ports or 
jack into these ports. It's the dumbest thing in the history of the business. Um, and it's it's so blatant. It's like they're literally just trying to sell more rifles. Oh, you, you basically every marine or every marine well, marine server used this thing. One of the few things marine server did right. Um, every soldier in the U.S. Army now has to have two rifles. The one that he carries on his shoulder, and then one that's going to be waiting for him in the back of his M3 uh, or his M2 APC. And of course, you know, Mr. and Mrs. John Q. Taxpayer have to actually pay for all this. A completely unnecessary system. To do something that no one should be doing anyway, which is firing your rifle from inside an APC. But hey, what do I know? These are the kind of stories that um, give the M2 Bradley or M3 Bradley its uh, rather rough reputation. Despite its pretty decent combat service. Uh, sometimes people, you know, um, lament their uh, vulnerability, their very limited armor protection. Okay, well, it is an APC. In all honesty, the M113 had like aluminum siding for armor. Uh, that's kind of why you see uh, in a lot of Vietnam uh, photos and footage, whenever you see an M113 driving around, everyone's piled up on top of the vehicle. Because the biggest threat to APCs in that war was landmines, and nobody trusted the vehicle's armor to protect you from a landmine. So they would sit on top of, they were less afraid of the M113's inability to protect them from a mine blast than they were from like NVA snipers. Because they would literally just be perched up on top of the vehicle in broad daylight. Alright, so we now have both sprues emptying off. Save the sprue, says Jennifer Levin, to make my own board cube. <laughs> That's actually true. If you guys ever see, uh, we've been talking a lot about Star Trek The Next Generation for some um, if you ever watched uh, TNG, especially um, episodes like uh, The End of Best of Both Worlds, when a Borg cube finally explodes, you will literally see empty model sprues. I dare you to go watch that episode. Watch the end of Season 4, Episode 1, which is Part 2 of Best of Both Worlds. When that Borg cube blows up, you will see burning sprues flying toward the camera. It's great. I love how they kit mash that stuff. All right, so I got my little instructions here. Um, with the M1 kit, we got an actual sheet of paper in there because there was like three or four different versions of the uh, of the uh, Bradley, the, or I'm sorry, of the Abrams that you could build. Here, uh, like we see often, you only have uh, a little bit of instructions on the back, which is fine because there isn't as many variants available in the box. So you can, uh, the manufacturers can get away with showing you a little bit less uh, instruction. So I'm going to start off with the easy stuff, or I should say the obvious stuff. I'm going to clean it a little bit better. Thanks very much for everybody in Europe who was with us. I know it's kind of late where you are, and I don't think most of you have tomorrow off. Or at least tomorrow is not a holiday in the UK or Poland. <laughs> Fortunately, it is here. We have tomorrow off for Memorial Day. All right, so this is obviously the front of the vehicle. This is obviously the back of the vehicle. Oh, perfect. So there's three guide points on one set of tracks and only two guide points on the other set of tracks. And they're set up in such a way so that way you can't accidentally put the wrong side of the tracks on the wrong vehicle. Or, sorry, the wrong tracks on the wrong side of the vehicle. <sighs> Dry fit first. Look at that, stays in there even without glue. Sign of a good kit. Okay, good. That part of the tracks I messed up are on the inside of the tracks, so I don't have to worry about it too much. I, I was trying to cut that off the sprue, and I really shaved. You can see right there where my fingernail is. I shaved way too close. So 
basically the hobby gods rolled a d6 and I got odds instead of evens. I got lucky on that one. Oh, hello Ben, how you doing? Welcome to the stream. So Ben, I don't know if you saw on uh, our podcast the other day, uh, Piotr has officially joined the Sit Rep Podcast team as a full-time member. I am trying to rebuild my forces now that I am uh, more or less running the Sit Rep Podcast. Before, I was just uh, one of the guys working on it. Now I am... I'm not going to take the call sign sit rep six. That's good. That's always bills. Uh, but I'm just, you know, more or less running the show. I'm still a risk ninja. All right. So that went together easy as pie. The only thing that's gone wrong so far um, has been totally my fault, which is, again, I over cut when I was trying to get that uh, sprue or this track assembly off the sprue. Um, fortunately for me, it's on the inside of the vehicle, so no one's ever going to see it. Uh, do the four-point squash, just to make sure that your vehicle always sits at a nice, um, level. Let me play around with the focus here. Okay, my girlfriend is now in the kitchen and she's dancing to my new stream music. So, <laughs> y'all will have to excuse me while I get some uh, singles out of my wallet. And uh, we thank you for coming out to our stream. But I'm going to go ahead and have to log off now. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, so um, we got the first part done with no problems. Uh, now I'm going to put the uh, tur I'm sorry, the whole deck on there, the main engine deck and glaciers, all that stuff. Pretty much the big top part for the hull. See how this fits on there. Ooh, nice. <laughs> Look at that. Look at how you know, I, I almost can't see it. How uh, how smooth that that join line is. You know what? Um, say what you will about uh, uh, Team Yankee the the game system. Uh, some people have issues with it. Uh, it's fine. It's fun. Um, you cannot fault their kids. I love their kids. Um, I don't want to screw up the camera right now, but later on when the stream is over, or when we're wrapping up the stream, I'll pan the camera up over at my uh, display case. You'll see about five or 650 millimeter miniatures in there. At least half of them, if not more than half, are, are all Battlefront. Oops. Maybe if I put it on frontwards. There we go. We also have some summer thunderstorms coming in. Because we're now at the back half of May. We're basically already in summer here in Florida. And uh, as Ben will tell you, every afternoon, somewhere between 2 and 4, you get a nice little thunderstorm. Which sounds bad until you live in Florida during the summer. And you realize that's about the only thing that keeps the temperature under 100. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and put the um, hull back on now. Again, it fits in there and stays without even any glue. I mean, it's not a snap tight model or anything. You do have to put glue in there, but obviously you always dry fit first. And uh, yeah, when it snaps in there, it will more almost stay in there even without glue. That's the, yeah, the sign of a great kit. So that's our hull mostly done. Uh, the stream music is a bit Doors-esque. I like it. 
Ben, if I could play the doors and not get hit with the mother of all copyright strikes, it's almost a good thing, because you guys would be listening to the doors every single day. Every single stream would be nothing but doors. Trust me. You guys would get tired, so sick of the doors. <laughs> I got a little bit of cleaning to do here on the turret. The top and bottom halves of the turret do fit together in kind of a jigsaw kind of a fashion there. You can see the how the pieces interlock. So long story short, yet again, um, you do have to do a pretty good job uh, cleaning. Any little bit of flash plastic in there will screw up the way the pieces fit together. Um, yeah, but I know what Ben's talking about, that little uh, jazz organ that you hear in this piece. That is definitely something the Doors made plenty of use of. I can't remember the organist's name. Should know this as a as a pretty hardcore doorsman. His name escapes me at the moment. I just knew, uh, Ben. I think we were talking about this before you joined the stream. That there was going to be a lot of cutting pieces out of the sprue. There was going to be a lot of uh, get that out of there. There was going to be a lot of pieces, you know, cutting pieces out of the sprue. There's going to be a lot of cleaning. A lot of long, slow, dull parts, so I wanted to get something a little bit more uh, fun uh, for the music. Okay, these two pieces of the turret are still not fitting together quite right. Not sure what I'm doing wrong. You cannot go wrong with the doors. Piotr? That is the most correct thing you've ever said <laughs> on the Sit Rep podcast. No, I'm just kidding. But yeah, I absolutely agree. All right, I'm going to go ahead and gamble that this piece is going to fit together as well as it does right now. Sometimes when you put glue on it, it changes the shape of the plastic. I guess it also depends on what kind of glue you're using. Just enough where it causes a problem. So wish me luck. Here we go. Excess glue on here, I have to get rid of. Looking at the picture here. Yeah, I definitely made a slight mistake. Okay, I see what's going on. Yeah, I made a little bit of a mistake with the glue on the turret bottom piece. Fortunately, this little turret bustle piece on the back is going to cover it up for me. So you can see where the excess glue is starting to bleach the plastic there. 
Um, even if the piece was not going to um, cover that up, the priming would cover it up. And even if that didn't work, uh, you can scrape a little bit of it off. So hopefully I've salvaged that slight mistake there. Tell you what, man, nothing beats the uh, the bustles on those Abrams, man. Uh, not to talk bad about the kits, I eventually got them on there, but man, that was that was a bit of a rough ride. Unlike this, which went on there pretty much smooth as butter. The only problem is right here. And that's my fault, I had a little bit of glue on my fingers. It's not the kid's fault. All right, cool. So that's the turret, more or less put together. There's a few more little uh, things to put together on there in just a second. Uh, okay, decision time, folks. Which era are we going for here? Are we going for 19? 80s, 1990s Bradley, which is probably what I'm going to do, or are we going for more modern uh, 2000s Bradleys? Oh boy. Oh, also I have to pick uh, Blaze's fronts. 1990s, 1980s, or 2000s. Uh, I'm going to go with the 1980s, 1990s. Plenty of Bradley saw plenty of action in the 2000s, obviously, especially in Iraq. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and stick with the 2000. I'm sorry, the 1990s uh, configuration, more or less, um, to facilitate either Team Yankee, which again I probably won't play Team Yankee with them. Uh, I should say in the Team Yankee setting, I'll use the system obviously, but. Um, a more of a 1991 Gulf War uh, kind of a setting. So, now that I've picked out those pieces, I just have to figure out which ones go where. So what I was saying before, when I got off on my little bit of a tangent about different Harold Coyle books and other... Um, big time novels in the techno thriller genre of the late 1980s because it was a lot uh, Harold Coyle was just one of them um, Harold Coyle even wasn't the first in fact he, he borrowed his setting Team Yankee technically is not his setting that is again from a different guy uh, Sir um, John Hackett former, uh, former uh, commander of NATO forces and in the late 70s he came out with a book called uh like I was saying before, you know, World War III in Europe. Or no, the Third World War, August 1985, technically. Alright, so that goes on there just like that. The thing, and then uh, obviously Harold Coyle then, in fact, you know what? Give me just a second, guys. Let me go ahead and find these books so we can talk about them real fast. Again, so everyone knows about Team Yankee the novel. It's literally what the game is based off of. Um, people have been making Team Yankee based war games since the 1980s. The very first Team Yankee war game 
was produced by GDW, part of their first battle series, way back in like 1988. I think this book came out in 1987. Um, you're really not going to give me a copyright date in here? Oh yeah, there it is, 1987. All right, so by 1988, the first Team Yankee War Game was out. Of course, it wasn't this one, but this is the one that we're talking about today. Obviously, Team Yankee, um, the, the game. All right, cool. The problem is Team Yankee, the book, doesn't take place in its own universe. It doesn't take place in its own, uh, for lack of a better term, cinematic universe. That is this book. Hackett's The Third World War, August 1985. So, again, if you... You guys probably already know this if you're into Team Yankee, but just in case, this is the uh, the setting or the universe in which um, Team Yankee is placed. So he says this in his book. He was like, all right, look, um, I'm not going to try to make up my own war. I'm going to go ahead and talk about, um, I'm going to set my characters in this other uh, general's, Coyle, I think, uh, retired as a, uh, as a major. Um, could be wrong about that, but it's either a major or lieutenant colonel. This is an actual, again, former commander of NATO forces, a British general, who uh, wrote this book uh, after he retired. And he envisioned, like, what the war could actually go, like, the big picture. So, again, if you're into things like Team Yankee, um, like, I know uh, Yvasa, uh, Piotr plays a lot of French. Um, if you're into, you know, their 2nd German Corps, their 7th U.S. Corps, 5th U.S. Corps, 3rd German Corps, Belgians, British, more Germans, Dutch. Up here you've got the Danes. Um, you've got all these other forces coming in here. The French actually do, I think, eventually get involved. you got to remember, France was not a member of NATO in those days. France joined NATO as a founding member in the, 19, um, in the 1940s, late 1940s. I think it joined in the early 50s. Dropped out in the late 60s rejoined, I believe it was 2006, 2007. So there was a period when France was technically not a NATO power. So during the classic Team Yankee era, it was always a big question whether or not France would actually help out or not. Um, the way it usually shakes out in most of these books is they don't at first, and then as the battle lines get closer and closer to France, they change their mind. But anyway, uh, this is the big picture, okay? So that's fine. Now, why, I'm, why do I keep bringing this stuff up? because of how I'm going to paint this actual Bradley eventually and what version of the armor I want to put on the sides. Believe it or not, this is all connected. Okay, Harold Coyle wrote a lot of books after Team Yankee. Team Yankee was only his first novel. Immediately after that, he writes something called Sword Point. And there's another one called Bright Star. These are not direct sequels to Team Yankee, but they might as well be. This is Harold Coyle after the success of Team Yankee. Team Yankee was a wild and successful book uh, back in the 80s. Um, he said, wait a minute. I'm going to start creating my own books, and this time I'm going to make them up on my own my own background, my own cinematic universe, whatever you want to call it, my own, my own backdrop. And Sword Point is basically Team Yankee in Iran. He wrote it in the late 80s, maybe early 1990s. This one was... Actually, I don't know. Let me look it up before I give you bad information here. Um, 1988. So, 1988, he came out with this book. And it was basically Team Yankee in Iran. Um, a terrorist group gets a hold of an atomic bomb in Iran somewhere. Sets off some kind of nuke in Kiev, I think it is. And now the Soviet Union invades Iran. And the Americans land forces in southern Iran out of the Persian Gulf to fight them. So it's the same general idea, Americans versus Soviets in the future of 1988, um, but fighting in Iran instead of in Germany. And then there's another book about this called Bright Star, which is the same thing pretty much except in Egypt. It's uh, named after the Bright Star exercises that we still hold with the Egyptian military to this day. Like they used to have reforgers every year, they still have Bright Stars in, um, in Egypt. So, I guess what I'm trying to say is there's a, a great use case to put American desert camouflaged or desert painted um, 1990s, 1980s armor up against Soviet stuff in the desert. And when the Soviets deploy stuff to the desert, as we see in places like Afghanistan, they usually don't paint it desert colors. 
they just stick with the same colors uh, that we see already. So I could put this stuff here up against this stuff here if I wanted to get theoretical. And instead of being, air quotes, Team Yankee, it would be Bright Star or Swordpoint. Those are still Harold Coyle novels. They're sort of the spiritual sequels to Team Yankee. Uh, I guess this would be the kind of thing that the Team Yankee Battlefront books cover in books like Oil Wars. Um, but that, that's kind of where I'm going with that. Along with my usual, which is pretty much just, um, you know, historical accuracy. Uh, you know, as fun as Team Yankee might be, it, it never happened, clearly. So I'm going to go more for Desert Storm or Iraqi Freedom. Uh, in the chat, Jen says he was played by Kyle MacLachlan in the movie. Yeah, we're talking about the organist for the doors. Again, his name escapes me at the moment. Oh, the real life guy. He's still around. He was one of the consultants for that movie. So I know that was kind of a long-winded conversation, but the point was to actually describe why I am uh, doing this thing the way I am. So notice the side skirt armor on the two sides of the Bradley are not symmetrical, but it's very easy to tell which one is which. It's fine. Uh, one last reason for why I'm choosing this version of the Bradley to put together. I have a 20 millimeter Bradley that is the, the A2 version with a different armor on there. I already have it built, it's already on my shelf. It's in 20 millimeter and it's for stuff like Force on Force and uh, you know uh, larger, more modern games. In the um, Iraqi Freedom or Enduring Freedom in um, Afghanistan, you know, those kind of uh, conflicts where it's a little bit more insurgency. It's a little bit more uh, infantry focused, um, and so on and so forth. You really only need one Bradley for that. One Bradley comes around the corner of one of those firefights, and it's like, holy shit, the goddamn tank division just showed up. Because you're usually fighting guys with AKs, RPKs, stuff like that. Alright, so we got the side armor put on. We have selected this for the uh, the front armor. I'm pretty sure it goes on there like that. Yeah, because there are the headlights we see. So clean and dry fit as always. Not enough glue, you can try again. Too much glue, you can't try again, and you may have ruined your model, so you want to be careful. All right, we got our turk, our, 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 our glacis plate on there. Uh, so Piotr says, I wonder if Oil Wars for Team Yankee is more or less based on this. Uh, it could be. Um, I know that Harold Coyle was, I don't want to tell tales out of school here, but I know that when Harold Coyle came out with Team Yankee, he was kind of surprised at how popular it would be. He has written at least 20 novels since then. Um, and since then, he has gotten a lot more cagey with, uh, or a lot more cautious with how his, you know, his publishing deals, how his stuff gets licensed and stuff like that. Like I said, GDW had the first Team Yankee based war game based on Team Yankee out in 1988. 
it, it was out literally the next year. Um, this game came out in, in 2015. So people have been making Team Yankee games and making a lot of money off it. I don't know if Harold Coyle sees any of that money, but there's never been a game based on a Harold Coyle game or a Harold Coyle novel since then. Whereas there have been at least three or four games based on Team Yankee. So I think the licensing, I'm just guessing here. I'm really kind of just, um, uh oh, did I screw this up? Did I monumentally screw up the, no, I didn't. Um, I think maybe the, the, the publishing or the rights or the license, the royalties kind of got away from it a little bit on the first one. You see that in a lot of uh, first novels, especially when it's a runaway hit. They probably offered him a standard deal, you know, for a new writer, and he accepted, and his agent said, yeah, sure, accept it. And then after that, man, holy crap. Um, it's also, we, we see it also with stuff like uh, uh, Tom Clancy. Um, Tom Clancy came out with Red Storm Rising, I'm sorry, uh, with uh, Hunt for Red October 1st. Um, and it was a huge success. There was a movie, there have been games, there's been this, there's been that. Red Storm Rising, not so much. And after that, a lot of video games came out, but by then, Tom Clancy more or less had his own game company. So a lot of these guys, I think, when they come out with their first novel, they don't know how popular it's gonna be. And um, when the second one comes around, they know how popular, they know how good they are. The market knows how good they are. And, uh, they're a lot, you know, they, they, they're a little bit more careful about what kind of agreements they sign. And by the time he passed, Tom Clancy was, uh, he had his own little empire going. As far as books, video games, um, teal television shows, I mean, how many, uh, how many Jack Ryan movies did they wind up making? Jack Ryan television shows. I know for one thing, after Tom Clancy saw Red Storm, I'm sorry, there we go again. After he saw um, Hunt for Red October, the movie, he was like, okay, from now on, I am not signing the rights over to my movies to anybody unless I have final say on the script. Because that movie, still a good movie. Um, and I'm not going to crow and whine about its historical accuracy because it obviously never happened. It's a work of fiction. But that movie does not pay attention to the book at all. <laughs> uh, in a lot of ways. All right, so obviously uh, the turret ring sits underneath the turret. Be careful. Make sure you dry fit it first if you're building this kit at home because it has to go on there a certain way. It's possible to put it on backwards. You'll know it's on backwards if the circle, if the little donut uh, gap in the middle does not line up concentrically with the where your turret pin is gonna go. Make sure that you turn these two little uh, pegs around that fit into these wells in such a way where the central, again, that donut ring is centered on the center of your turret. And then uh, it's up to you whether or not you want to magnetize your models. I always choose not to. Uh, you put the pin in there to actually rotate your, uh, your turret on your model. Um, but make sure that sits in there in the central. It's, it's, make sure it's well centered uh, there in that gap. You want that that little ring that you see there, that recessed ring, to be as even as possible, because that's what sits there on that little raised ring uh, on the hull. And make sure it's a very clean fit. Make sure there's not too much glue. Like you can see a little bit of glue in there. So I'm not going to put the turret on the model yet because if I do that while the glue is still wet, I might wind up gluing the turret permanently to the um, to the hull, and I don't want to do that because then it won't rotate anymore. All right, and we're almost there, folks. Let me just look at a few more pieces. Okay, this piece here. We will not be using. This is another piece that fits on the M2A2 or the M3A2. In other words, the 2000 versions of the Bradley. So that goes in my bit box. Where the deuce does this piece go? I literally do not see this in the instructions. OK. 
Okay, I will come back to that. Oh, I see it there. It goes underneath the glacis plate. only for the more modern kits. So again, the parts that are outlined in red in the instructions are the ones that go on the M1A2. I'm sorry, the M2A2 or the M3A2. So that's the piece right there. It's shown at a weird angle, so it doesn't quite look the same. But that's the piece they're talking about right there. Again, you see it's outlined in red. It goes to the M2A2 or the M3A2. In other words, the 2000 variants, i.e. I'm not really gonna put that on there. So that gets us down to just these two pieces, the commander's hatch and the tow launcher. Right, I'm not going to lie, this tow launcher is going to be a pain in the ass. Because they don't give you any kind of hints or information on this. Uh, ben Johnson says, summers in Florida are rough, especially in the greenhouse business. Yeah. We are just entering the kind of miserable time in Florida here. Um, where it's three months of absolutely brutal heat at least. At least three months. All of June, all of July, all of August. And by the time you're in August, well, congratulations, now you're in hurricane season. Uh, which is just as bad. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and zoom this in so you guys can see what I'm doing here. This way, if I do it wrong, uh, I have an excuse. So what we're looking at is this piece right here. All right, and I'm jiggling this all over the place. All right, you can see where that little raised piece that sits on top of the tow missile launcher is a little bit further to the back. And the piece that sort of uh, extends on the bottom is a little bit further to the forward. So that's gonna be a little counterintuitive if you're building this kit. Because again, it's, it's a double missile launcher. Again, I'll zoom in a little bit so you can see what's happening. So if I go by that, in other words, that's the way it looks on the box. Okay, that forward piece on the bottom is to the front, and the forward piece on the top is to the back. Now it's going to look a little weird because the two actual missile ports are in the back of the vehicle, which it looks like I have to clean this thing. But I think that's expected because these aren't the holes from which the missiles fly. This is where the, uh, the, the, uh, the exhaust vent goes as the missile launches. And the front of the, um, the little tow missile pod is much more flush. So that pretty much just breaks open and the missiles kind of fly out the, the front of the, of, the, uh, of the launcher there. Wow, this camera is merciless. It looks a lot worse on camera than it does in real life. I guess that's a good thing. And again, look at my hands. Ah! I got Crypt Keeper hands on here. All right, so that's the way, according to the instructions, the best way I can I can see it, that's the way it fits on there. So if it's wrong, um, I blame the box. Now I just have to figure out how to attach it. Oh, I see what's going on. Okay, it attaches a lot easier than I thought. 
Okay, zoom in again. Because this has given me no end of grief, even in 20 millimeter models. And so I want to make sure I kind of get it right here. Um, okay, so we see the, that's not quite right on the focus. All right, again, this extended piece on the top goes further to the back. And this little knob on the inside, once you know which side goes forward and which side goes back, you know which side is forward, uh, which side is inboard and outboard on the vehicle. So this tiny little, um, come on, focus. This tiny little uh, um, shelf, or this little this little protrusion here on the inside part of the Bradley, fits right between these two uh, pegs, almost like hinges in the door. And that's because it actually does that in real life. It's down here when the vehicle's moving, and then when it's ready to fire, it doors up, so to speak. It hinges up to a firing position, uh, more like that. I'm going to go ahead and make mine in a firing position. It is more fragile that way, but it's going to look cooler, let's be honest. It's ready to actually put a toe into an Iraqi T-72 that way. But word to the wise, your kit will be a little bit more fragile this way. So hopefully that makes it a little bit more clear. There's still a little bit of flash on there, damn it. Um, hopefully that makes it a little bit more clear as far as how it hinges up and down uh, in the real vehicle. Of course, your kit won't do that. You have to make a decision here whether or not you want your uh, tow position, your tow boom or whatever, your tow launcher in its firing position or in its uh, stowage position. I'm gonna pick its firing position where it's up like that real fast before the glue dries. It folds down and it looks more like that when it's in stowage position. But I'm going to put mine up here in firing position and then let the glue dry um, so that it looks a little bit more combat ready. And again, those two little um, exhaust ports are in the back. They look like firing ports. They're not really firing ports. They're more like exhaust ports. They're in the back of the that's kind of the way it's supposed to sit on. To my knowledge, that's the way it's supposed to fit on. Like so. Okay, and then the last thing to do is your, um, your uh, commander's hatch. Now, it's again, first decision you have to make here is number one, get your camera focused. Um, is whether or not to uh, make your hatch open or close, whether or not you're going to put a commander in here. I'm not going to put a commander in here, so this hatch is going to be closed. Super easy. It fits right there on the hinges, and you're fine. Ooh, maybe not. Oh no, I just broke my tow launcher. All right, and that is the completed build, again, without a commander, of the M2 slash M3. So what's the difference between the M2 and the M3? Because you're gonna hear those two terms kind of thrown around a lot. Um, again, I'm gonna be super general here and I'm gonna stick to gaming relevant stuff all right so this vehicle here carries two this little launcher here carries two tow missiles two anti-tank missiles in real life uh, i'm not sure how exactly it works in team yankee the game but in real life it fires two tow missiles it then the crew then does what they call reload drill or missile drill where they fall back a little bit they get under some kind of protection and they uh, reload that little box like uh, boom launcher with two more tow missiles, and that's it. That's all it's got. All the other internal volume of the vehicle is consumed with or dedicated to um, the six infantrymen, which is already tragically, very, very badly, not enough. It's already insufficient. Uh, an American rifle squad is at least eight, usually nine men. 
uh, two fire teams of four and possibly a squad leader. Sometimes the squad leader is one of the fire team leaders, so you might have a total of eight. Either way, you have an APC that's supposed to carry a squad of infantry that is physically incapable of carrying a squad of infantry. This is the reason a lot of people hate the Bradley. Um, but whatever, that's the M2. Then you have the M3, which is sometimes called the cavalry version. It's an ACV, Armored Cavalry Vehicle, as opposed to an APC, Armored Personnel uh, Carrier. And the ACV, or the M3, or whatever you want to call it, uh, pretty much eschews carrying infantry at all, and carries nothing but a lot more tow missiles. Um, so that thing can do that missile reload drill a lot more times. There are some other minor technical differences between the two, but that, in game terms, that's, that's the most of it. Um, the M2 carries a few missiles and some infantry. The M3 carries a shit ton of missiles. It can still only fire two at a time, but um, it, can, it can reload and, uh, and fire pretty much all day, as far as the game goes. All right. So, last thing, and this is not in the kit, this is just a, 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 an Ariskany special thing. Um, I like to put antennas on my vehicles, because why not? So I get this off of a small dustpan broom. Um, one small dustpan broom has about 17 trillion of these bristles on it. I'm not even sure if it's showing up on camera there. Looks like it is. Um, and it's like the perfect size. I do not use the uh, bristles off of a regular whisk broom or like, like a floor broom like you might use in your living room or your kitchen because that would be too thick. I do have some of those on some of my old uh, Soviet shulkas, and it just looks too large. It looks like they have these gigantic broomstick handles uh, hanging off the back of the turret. I found this broom that has much thinner, and yet it's still plastic, it's still very sturdy. And again, for $1.99, I wound up with a lifetime supply of these uh, radio antenna. Another great thing Battlefront kits do is it gives you this little um, tiny well there. It's not really showing up on camera. But... Uh, this little uh, well right there, which is a great place to put um, a, radio, a radio antenna. So sometimes it's really hard to put these uh, antenna on the tank where it'll stay. But again, Battlefront does a great job of giving you that little miniature tunnel, that little well that you can just kind of stick it in there. Ooh, that's too tall. That is way too tall. Hold on. That's a little better. Um, cool. In fact, even that might be a little bit too tall. You just don't want it to look absurd. Make sure that it is standing up straight on all three kind of directions there. All right, cool. And that is our Bradley. Yeah, I'm gonna paint, I'm gonna prime this black, just like my Abrams, which are already done, as you can see. And then uh, I'm gonna come in here with the airbrush and do all 10 of the vehicles, you know, all five Abrams. And uh, once I've finished building the other five, um, the other five Bradleys, and then just do all 10 vehicles with the same coat of desert tan. I'm gonna be aiming for something like this, okay? And that way, hey, if it's right or wrong, it almost doesn't matter, at least they'll all be the same. And um, at least they won't look completely ridiculous when you put them on the table. That's the reason I did not finish painting the M1s before I started building the Bradleys. If I can get them all to the same point and at least do the airbrush part all at once. I'll use some Vallejo Desert Tan or you know some German Dunkel Geld or something. You know, I'll, I'll figure it out as far as uh, what kind of uh, desert I want to get on there. So, um, okay, we have... Uh, 
He was played with Kyle. Oh, yeah. Um, Piotr says, do the original one. Yeah, that's what I did. I went ahead and I did the 1980s, 90s version. Again, this way I can use it for Desert Storm. Um, uh, Desert Storm, uh, historical scenarios. Or if I wanted to get hypothetical, I could put them up against 1980s or 1990s uh, Soviet stuff in a Bright Star or Sword Point uh, type of a scenario. Um, because, you know, I don't know, I've, just, I've never really been into the whole, um, at least on a miniature table, I've never been into the whole uh, Team Yankee miniature uh, side of it. Um, nothing against the game, nothing against the setting or whatever. It's just a lot of people do it. And, you know, I want to do something different. But honestly, again, for people who watch me on the show, I'm normally a historical guy. I will almost always go with the real life historical option. That means Desert Storm. That means Desert Sand. So, yeah, that is Mr. Bradley put together, along with some of his contemporaries. We've already showed the, uh, the M1 Abrams, the M60, uh, the two versions of the uh, M, uh, I'm sorry, the two versions of the T72. Uh, the T80. Um, now that that's all finally painted and put together. And then of course we have some leopards. Uh, I should get some orders out here. The, the German equivalent uh, of, the, uh, of the Bradley. Also a BMP. So let me stop showing tanks and start showing some... Uh, a lot of dust on these. Alright, so stop comparing apples to oranges here. So again, the M2 Bradley up against a mortar. This is the German sort of equivalent of the, uh, that focus still ain't right, damn it. Um, this is the uh, German uh, equivalent, roughly, of the, uh, of the M2. Also with some sort of automatic cannon, smoke uh, projectors, and uh, anti-tank missile launcher on there. Roughly the same size. The, um, the Bradley's a little bit taller, so it presents a little bit more of a, of a target. And we have our old friends. Two most common pieces of junk you're going to see on any battlefield. The BMPs. So I got a BMP2 here. Uh, the fastest way to tell the difference between a BMP-1 and a BMP-2, BMP-2 has a 30mm uh, automatic cannon, roughly the same size as the 25mm Bushmaster we see on the Bradley, or the uh, automatic cannon we see on the Martyr, and an AT-4 or AT-5 uh, anti-tank missile launcher on there. Oh, a lot of them are missing these nowadays. Okay. And then, here's the BMP-1. Now, you'll notice my BMP-1s look a little weird down here on the bottom part, as opposed to the BMP-2. So when I got the kit, it gives you a BMP-1 turret, a BMP-2 turret, a BMP-1 hull top, and a BMP-2 hull top, and then one set of wheels. So deciding to be cagey. I literally, this is just cardboard. I printed my own. Um, I basically built my BMP ones. I took a high definition photograph of the back of the vehicle. I scaled it as closely as I could. And then I literally just printed it and put it in cardboard. My tracks don't look so hot. They're literally just bands of cardboard. And same thing with the wheels. So I'll get that in focus, hopefully. It's not wanting to focus there. So with a little bit of cardboard work, and uh, of course the, the the whole front is pretty easy. It's just a, a black, um, it's just a, a flat sheet of cardboard. So I basically took the spare parts that they give you in the BMP kit, and I got free, five free miniatures out of it. Um, <laughs> in a weird kind of way. Oh no wonder I'm on autofocus. Damn it. Wonder it wouldn't focus. Autofocus doesn't really work on this camera. Sorry about that, guys. All right, so now maybe you can see a little bit better what I'm talking about there. So, again, I'm not saying everybody uh, does this, 
Uh, because they'll stop giving you extra pieces if, if everyone literally takes their five miniature kit and makes ten miniatures out of it. Um, also, it was a lot of work, and you got to be pretty handy in Photoshop. I'm not going to lie. Um, but I was able to sort of get away with uh, making a false bottom on my BMP ones. It's really just three or four pieces. Two uh, sides, the back, and the front, and then of course I had to make my own little tracks. And even then, they don't look quite as good. Um, but again, it's just BMP ones, and you put them on the table from two feet away, it looks, you know, kind of, you know, it, it's, it's tough to tell. But anyway, these are sort of the contemporaries. The only one I don't have here that I really should is an MC-80. MCV-80 or the Warrior is the, big, is the big British version of uh, what's pretty much uh, this family of vehicles. Uh, the Germans have the Martyr, the Americans have the Bradley, the British have the Martyr. Uh, those are the big three NATO types when it comes to tracked APCs. But um, I'm not really building a British force because I'm not that interested in building a British force. Everybody has a British force. I'm sticking to my Americans and my Germans and, of course, my Soviets. Because you have to have some bad guys. All right, guys, so that about wraps us up for today. I will uh, check out uh, the comments one more time. But for now, that is the Bradley. Um, again, the original 1980s and 90s for, uh, variant um, without the additional um, armor, uh, modular armor that gets bolted on later on in the 2000s. So again, if you're looking for a more modern look, if you're looking for an uh, invasion of Iraq or invasion of Afghanistan kind of a, of a Bradley, you would use these extra pieces. Um, I am not. This goes on the, uh, the whole of the face of the turret. This goes on the underside of the, uh, the whole front, the whole bow. So anyway, those four or five pieces, that's what you use if you are um, building a 2000s sort of a type of rally. I'm sticking with the 80s and 90s, so I stuck with the original configuration. I gotta do a little bit more cleaning here, but I'll do that off camera. I'm still not happy with how that part looks. And whatever I can't clean up, uh, the priming will cover. So everything will be fine. Oh, I just knocked over my radio antenna. It's fixed. Okay, so um, uh, Damon uh, says uh, I would be tempted to beef up the launcher attachment uh, up. To, oh, beef, beef up the launch the launcher attachment with a bit of sprue glued underneath to make it stronger in gaming. Yeah, you can totally do that. You can take a small piece of uh, sprue and cut like a little length of it off and just kind of stick it underneath. Kind of stick it underneath there to make it a little bit stronger because in the, its non-launch configure in its launch configuration it's only kind of on there with two or three very very small joints um and of course everybody wants to turn the turret in gaming oh i'll turn the turret and you're, you're literally going to just push on the tow launcher sooner or later that's going to break off so that's actually not a bad idea i'll probably do that uh david that's actually a really good idea um, Piotr says it should be safe as soon as the glue dries completely, but better safe than sorry. Um, Jen says Ninja Tank. Oh yeah, we're talking about everybody in black. Um, I'm always, I don't know about you guys, but whenever I prime a bunch of tanks black, I'm always half tempted to leave them just like that. Because some kind of weird, like, Night Wolf Brigade. <laughs> Ridiculous, uh, fictitious, uh, unit or whatever. But of course, I'll, I'll prime them later. Or I'll, I'll, I'll paint them. Uh, one of these days, I need to leave them all black. One time, when I was doing all these T, uh, all these T62s, T72s, excuse me, way back in the uh, in 2015, I had like 15 of these all primed black, and um, I wasn't gonna leave them black, obviously. I, for, uh, guys, forgive me for the painting. This is back when I was using rattle cans, so this is all done not even with an airbrush. Um, yeah, this is also like seven years ago. But anyway, when they were all black, I took a picture of them. Put it in Photoshop, and I added red racing stripes to them in Photoshop. Of course, I wasn't going to do that in real life, ruin my 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 my, my, uh, my miniatures. But that that photo wound up on the, on the website. Um, my my uh, T72 racing team. <laughs> so Peter says um, the BMP uh, Malutka rocket uh, looks like fireworks. Um. Oh, the BMP... 
Okay, so we're not talking about the BMP2 Piotr with the AT4 or the AT5, or the Maluka is a different name for the AT. I only go. I only know the the, um, the NATO names. So AT4 Spandrel, AT5. Um, those are the names I'm familiar with. Not sure about the Maluka. Uh, what what that name sounds familiar, but it's escaping me. It's probably the real Soviet name or the real Russian name uh, for that weapon system. So Ben Johnson uh, says, awesome, cool, Ben, thanks very much. And uh, yeah, there we go. All right, guys, we've been up now for uh, not quite, uh, well, a little bit more than an hour and a half. Um, we have built one vehicle. So I'm happy with the way it has turned out for the Bradley Troop, 15 millimeter for Team Yankee. Oh uh, yeah, oh, the BMP-1, gotcha. Um, Oh yeah, the a the AT the AT three. Yeah, it does look like a little uh, something you would launch on the Fourth of July. That's that's how it sits on there. It just sits there on this little pin, this little rail, that's bolted on top of the uh, seventy six millimeter um, gun. Um, it gives the BMP literally one shot with an anti tank guided weapon, uh, some sort of a um, fiber optic guided, uh, very early generation fiber optic guided missile. In numbers, like the Israelis learned to their cost in uh, 1973, it, it, it would do damage against, uh, a lot of damage against the M48s, M60s down in the Sinai, and uh, the shots and shot cows up, in, uh, up on the Golan. That's for damn sure. Yep, Jen says, thanks everybody for coming out. I couldn't agree more. But uh, yep, that's where we are. I'm going to go ahead and build the other four of these. Probably why I watched some more of my brand new physical media, Star Trek The Next Generation uh, discs. Those are like my new favorite five prize possession. My Star Trek The Original Series have also come in. So I've also watched my Gorn episode, uh, Arena, in season one. That's probably another one of my favorite episodes of all time. I love the Gorn. I used to play Gorn in um, Star Trek Tactical Combat Simulator. Uh, I still miss my old Gorn shifts. But anyway, that has nothing to do with what we're talking about. Um, so once I finish building the other four of these Bradleys, uh, I'll make one of them the commander. I'll leave the hatch open for the commander in there. That will uh, wrap up that troop. I will then prime them black and get, once my whole American Army mechanized force is kind of at the same stage, I'll come back with the um, air gun, the airbrush, and I will... Uh, base coat them all to that basic color and then who knows maybe next week we'll have another stream where i start working on the tracks or uh, the block details and stuff like that so thanks very much everybody again for coming out again this is a risky gym with the sit rep podcast uh peter says good show and good night all yeah thanks very much everybody especially in europe who hung with us i know it's coming up on nine or ten o'clock uh, for you guys over there, depending on where you are on the continent. So thanks very much, everybody. Uh, this is Ariskany Jim signing off for the weekend. I am going to take tomorrow off uh, for real, both from job and from sit rep, because it's Memorial Day. And uh, for Memorial Day, it's time to, at least here in the United States, it's uh, it's time to not just have a beer and a hot dog, but also, um, you know, remember everybody who, has um, served in the armed forces and um, was not lucky enough to come back. So again, Veterans Day is for people who have served in the past. Armed Forces Day is for people who are serving now, at least here in the States. And Memorial Day is for the people that uh, didn't make it back. So not to end on a downer note, but just a quick uh, reminder, at least for our audience here in the States, uh, to you know, think about um, some people you may have known or think about the people in general, um, you know, servicemen and women who, um, honestly, you know, last full measure um, for our way of life. But for now, that way we all can sit here and play with little toy tanks and not have to worry about real tanks crashing through our house. Like we're seeing happen in some parts of the world right now. It, it's not hypothetical. This stuff can happen. So, you know, there are people out there making sure that it doesn't happen, and every once in a while, that requires a one hell of a sacrifice. And that's what Memorial Day is all about. So, thanks very much, everybody. Um, cheers all, says Damon. Absolutely. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks again for coming out. 
Uh, Tango Mike for this thing says, Jennifer Lemon, Jen, that's my line, okay? You can, you can steal my line. Stop it. Right? But in all seriousness, everybody, we are t- we are uh, rounds complete here on the Sit Rep Podcast for another Sunday. Um, Tango Mike for listening. Thanks very much, everybody. If you're watching this stream right now, do consider dropping a like on our channel. It helps the YouTube algorithm notice us and helps us um, kind of get the message out there. YouTube puts us out in front of more new potential viewers, and sometimes those people look at our channel and subscribe, and our community grows a little bit. It's a real way that it can actually help, and it doesn't cost anything. Uh, it's not theoretical. We, we're actually seeing it happen. Our numbers are growing, um, and it's mostly just from people dropping a lot of likes. Likes, comments, and stuff that proves to the YouTube algorithm that people are actually watching our program and interacting with it, uh, and not just you know clicking on it and clicking off to something else. So thanks very much, everybody, um, for whatever you can do. We always appreciate it, and we'll be in touch on Discord, on Facebook. Um, we try to uh, reply to every comment here on YouTube. Either way, yeah, if you guys reach out to us, we'll definitely uh, get back to you. So thanks very much, everybody, and we'll be in touch very soon. Take care, everybody, and enjoy the rest of your